I uh, want to just say that, um, okay, so today we have um, Brenda Child, who is a, a historian, a author. Um, we have a couple, I have a couple of books here, Bow Wow Pow Wow and My Grandfather's Knocking Sticks. Um, she has several others. And she's also a professor at the University of Minnesota Twin Cities campus uh, in the American, uh, American Studies and American Indian Studies programs um, or departments. Uh, let's see. So she's here to share with us and discuss with us about the healing power and the history behind the jing jingle dress. Um, and uh, we, we both hope that you watch the, the, the 16 minute video that um, Brenda is featured in um, to kind of give you some basis about this um, and some information about this, uh, this topic. And um, there's going to be a time where you're going to be able to ask some questions. We, we do want you to ask the question in, in the chat. Um, and there might be uh, some time where we will be able to unmute you um, to, to share as well. Um, but before I turn it over to Brenda, I just want to, uh, I, I did mail her some apicos again, uh, some tobacco for this request. Wanted to do that in a good way. I want to thank our, our funders, uh, the, the Minnesota Department of Be Human Services Behavioral Health uh, Division uh, for sponsoring this. Uh, rules of engagement, so keep yourself uh, muted for now and don't share your video screen. Uh, you'll be able to turn, uh, turn those on when, when and if you have a question. Um, I'll moderate that when, when the time comes. Um, if you have issues uh, with anything, you can, um, you can um, contact Becky directly. Becky Nelson is our Zoom assistant. And then um, if you have a question, feel free to put it in the chat anytime during the conversation um, or presentation. Um, and then if you are, want that question to be anonymous, you can directly send it to me. And then let's see what else. I am recording this session. And so um, I will be able to mail this, email this out to everybody that registered. And let's see. One last thing is Becky, uh, towards the end, will post the link to our survey. Uh, we would like for you all to fill that out. I will be emailing it out as well at, after this session. Um, we'd love to have your feedback on this session. I will be providing that to uh, Brenda and also to our funder. And so it is anonymous and um, just take five minutes to fill that out. It's gonna help us with a few, few possible future funding as well. So I'm gonna turn this over to Brenda. I'm gonna put myself on mute now. So thank you so much, Brenda Miigwech for being here with us today. Yeah, it's nice to be with you all, especially during this time when we're not very, um, social and i've seen a few names come up here friends of mine that i miss seeing so at least i get to spend a little bit of time with you um, this afternoon i may myself um i was saying have some who know i put my dog outside you know all these things that happen when you're trying to conduct your business life uh at home so hopefully we won't have too much interference but if there is you know we'll just um hopefully you'll be uh, kind and kind of suffer through that with me. But yeah, so I, I'm hopeful that you have been able to watch the little short 17 minute um, film, Jingle Dress Dancers in the Modern World. It's funny how this all kind of came about doing that short documentary because last year, well, for 2019, I had been planning actually for a couple years prior to it, several years prior to it, um, to actually put together an exhibit at uh, working with the community at Mille Lacs for the for the museum there on the reservation 
And I was thinking about it being the anniversary, the hundredth anniversary of the jingle dress dance tradition, which as I, you know, explain in that film came about as a result of in the aftermath of the terrible influenza pandemic of a century ago. So here I was preparing that, working with students, talking about meeting with the historical society, getting historic dresses put together for that exhibit. And the exhibit opened really wonderfully in a really nice way at Mille Lacs in um, the spring of uh, 2019. Women brought in their dresses uh, for the opening. They wanted to take part. We had a big dance, in fact, through the museum because the women wanted to dance in the dresses, the old dresses that were there. And I wanted to just sort of talk about that history of the jingle dress dance tradition and to kind of celebrate and to create an awareness that there was, uh, it was the 100th anniversary of the jingle dress dance tradition. So the exhibit ran for a season and that was all very nice. And then it closed up as the museum does in October of uh, 20, 2019. And then, you know, the events of the next month took place and the uh, exhibit was closed along with the museum and most of the historical society um, last, you know, in, in the aftermath of the pandemic arriving in, in the United States. So, how um, interesting, what a great coincidence that this exhibit, a century, looking at what happened a century ago, would also, um, you know, would be thinking so much about this tradition and its origins at the very moment another global pandemic arrived in the United States. One, um, and this was the last one. We've had many different influenza, many terrible viruses, we've had polio, but this what we're now experiencing is the is the second you know global pandemic the first being the 1918-19 influenza that killed more people than the first world war so what a coincidence and um so kind of here we are i think i'll ask um ivy to put up the powerpoint and i'll i'll kind of run through a few images. There's a little bit of text as well, because I want to talk a bit about the history. But then um, I want to leave plenty of time. So uh, certainly by 3.30, we want to be wrapping everything up and uh, asking uh, if you have questions or comments about the jingle dress dance. Okay, so you can, this is an image from Standing Rock that we used in the exhibit. Uh, but you can go on to the next one, um, Ivy. So what I wanted to do with the exhibit was um, to talk about Zabaska Egana Good Day, the jingle dress um, at its 100th anniversary. And there were a couple of points I wanted to get across that if you were uh, did have time to watch the film, you probably understand pretty well. But one of them was just simply, while many Ojibwe and other American Indians know the story of the origin of the jingle dress dance with the story of the little girl falling ill, her father having a vision. I was laughing because I was talking to somebody, a man who was Hopi, maybe Osage, wasn't Osage, but another tribe from Oklahoma. He was, had a mixed background. And I said something about the jingle dress in passing. And he recited this story to me of the origin of the jingle dress dance. And I thought, wow, that's really, it's really, that story has really gone out beyond the, beyond the borders of the Great Lakes. And I thought that was so interesting. So what I wanted to do though was, while most Ojibwe people know the story of the jingle dress dance, the story of the little girl getting very ill, the father's vision, because that story is not necessarily set in a particular historical moment, I wanted to kind of place it um, because I believe that it was very directly related to the influenza epidemic a century ago. And there were numerous things that caused me to realize this. One was the story itself where the girl was experiencing kind of a flu-like illness. Um, the other was reading historical documents, but that talked about how devastating the influenza was in Ojibwe country and also just in Indian country generally. It was really terrible among Native Alaskans. 
um, and, uh, and into Canada and all over North America, really. So I wanted to kind of get that story across about the history of the epidemic. But the other thing that persuaded me, and you can show the next slide too, which is just more about, I think, the second point about the Standing Rock story. Um, the other thing that persuaded me that the jingle dress arose around the time of the flu epidemic was I went looking at photo collections in the United States and Canada, and I realized that I couldn't find um, an image of what you would call a jingle dress before circa 1920. In, and I looked at collections throughout the uh, Minnesota into Canada, and I thought, wow, as a historian that told me something very big had happened that gave rise to this whole new healing tradition, one that's still with us, and of course beyond Ojibwe and Dakota communities um, today to be very widespread, right? And so I also, so that was one point, the history of the dress in the, um, in the context of this big influenza epidemic. The second point I wanted to make, which you can kind of see here in the story of the, um, of Standing Rock and the Jingle Dress Dancers and Standing Rock, I wanted to talk about, and I like this word, some people don't among conservative politicians in the United States, but it was to me a radical tradition. And it has been a radical tradition, not just since women showed up at Standing Rock in their jingle dresses, but it's been that way since the very beginning. And I'll say more what I mean about that. You can go on IV and we'll see what's next. Um, yeah, so this is the story is, um, you know, we hear the story in Mille Lacs. We hear a very similar story of the origin of the jingle dress dance tradition in Whitefish Bay, Ontario. Both communities claim to be the, the um, center of the jingle dress dance tradition. And the way I've kind of come to understand that point is that, you know, so if the jingle dress dance is given in a vision to Ojibwe people and the aftermath of this ep epidemic, why one community, right? Why one person? So I, I, I don't think necessarily that the Mille Lacs tradition spread to Whitefish Bay way up in Ontario or that the Whitefish Bay Ojibwe spread it down to Mille Lacs. It probably arose simultaneously there and perhaps in other Ojibwe communities because there were many, um, many dances and healing traditions and, and expressions, cultural expressions like this taking place in the early 20th century. Now, those of us from Minnesota know this was a very dire period, not just the flu epidemic and the First World War, but this was also a very difficult time because of the dispossession that was taking place in the post allotment Great Lakes, right, which is another factor in all of this. What, you know, so this epidemic lands in the midst of this period of dispossession, because for Ojibwe people, that big land loss kind of came in the aftermath um, of the allotment policies and the Nelson Act and so forth in Minnesota. You can move on to the next. Hmm. I'm not sure why this isn't showing up, but this is a picture uh, from Red Lake that's beautiful because they're all Red Lakers. Um, some of you may know I'm from Red Lake, but this is supposed to be, a, who knows why this isn't showing up, but you can move on, Ivy. It was just a photo from Red Lake of Jingle Dress Dancers. But again, even if you go to the digital archives of the Minnesota Historical Society and you type in Jingle Dress Dance, you see all these images from different communities. So this is Pequot Lakes. You can show the next one, Ivy. This is one of up in your community at Grand Portage. Women were performing the jingle dress and dancing the jingle dress at Grand Portage as well. The next slide is from, I think up north too, the Grand Portage powwow, um, jingle dress dancers. I don't know exactly what this year is, but it could have been the 20s, it could have been the 30s, you know, or even the 1940s. And the next image, here we are in Walker and you see women in their jingle dresses here. Must have been a very blustery day. I can only imagine with all these feathers that are 
that are um, blowing in the wind here. And then what else? Um, so in this era, I mean, the other interesting thing, and, and also talking about this idea of a radical tradition, this is, of course, an era of tremendous suppression of Native cultures in the United States. And in order for to continue participating and practicing dances, powwows, and especially our ceremonial lives, American Indians had to um, be somewhat, I don't know, subversive. I don't know if that's the word. But um, we know, and this is true of Red Lake, that we started flying the American flag and saying, hey, don't be critical of what we're doing here. It's the 4th of July. This is how we celebrate. We come out and we dance. And so that's what's sort of going on um, you know, in a lot of Native communities at the time. In order to be kind of legitimate in the eyes of the United States, um, we are having to you know, um, put up the American flag, hold our celebration, say, well, you know, we're just celebrating the 4th of July. And to give a kind of um, veneer maybe of, of acceptance because Indian agents and others were still watching kind of the every move of Native people on reservations. And this was a time when people in the US were very critical of American Indian traditions of song and dance. So I know I talked about that a little bit in the documentary, but I want to say just a bit more about it. And Ivy, let me see what's on the next slide. I don't know if I'm talking to Ivy or Becky here, but I'll say Ivy. Yeah, so this is what I sort of wanted to get to. Um, you know, this semester at the university, I'm teaching federal Indian policy. And the first day of class, I said, let's talk about the pandemic um, in terms of federal Indian policy. And so we were talking about what's going now, you know, with, um, I have some good colleagues in Arizona who have been um, talking about how devastating the epidemic has been on the Navajo reservation down with the Mississippi Band of Choctaws. There's been tremendous um, suffering and devastation in that community. And many of us have experienced um, the last year in terms of personal losses. Um, friends or relatives that we have lost to the terrible uh, COVID. But what I wanted to kind of emphasize with my students in the federal Indian policy uh, is that the same moment that women are creating this remarkable new tradition of healing, the Indian office in Washington is trying to suppress traditional forms of ritualistic dance on reservations. So. Isn't it interesting that the very moment that women are uh, creating this new tradition still with us today, the Indian office is trying to suppress traditions of song and dance. So um, there is a famous circular, famous to historians anyway, circular 1665 that came out of the Indian office. And it's, you just have a short bit of it here, but it's, um, gosh, let me see, it's one, it's almost two full single spaced type page about um, the problem of native dance. And the part you can see here is, you know, at first they're saying, you know, um, this is uh, the commissioner of Indian affairs in 1921, who is not one of my favorite people in history. His name was Charles Burke. And he talked about, um, you know, and he's a little bit torn over this. Um, he's saying, well, not everything, you know, you can see this in the early, not everything is terrible about Indian dancing, but he says, um, you know, it's kind of human nature, right? We all have dance, but he's saying um, the dance, however, under most primitive and pagan conditions is apt to be harmful. And when found to be so among the Indians, we should control it by educational processes as far as possible, but if necessary, by punitive measures when its degrading tendencies persist. And to me, this is like a quintessential document to come from the Indian office, because first of all, the Indian office is, is saying, well, you know, maybe this is not so bad dancing in itself. But when you get 
and you're, you know, it's being performed by primitive and pagan people who should be on the road to Christianity, then it's harmful. And we're going to try to educate the Indians. One, policy. We're going to educate the Indians out of their pagan dance. But if they persist, maybe we need punitive measures, right? And I have a wonderful colleague who has just written a new book. Ah, it's actually under my laptop. I'm going to show it to you. Um, can you see me? You can take that off now and I'll just talk, Ivy. Or Becky. But there's a wonderful new book called Surviving Genocide by my colleague Jeff Osler. And it just came out this past year. And he talks about this troubling idea of genocide in American history. And he says that this is often the policy of the United States, where generations of American historians have tried to say, no, we weren't trying to kill the Indians off. There wasn't real genocide. He says, just because you say that, first of all, we're going to try to control them by education and Christianization, and only if they resist do we need to take harsher measures. What he always says is plan B is also policy, right? Not just plan A, but plan B. And so often in the history of the United States, during the time when we were trying, they were trying to dispossess, remove, get Indians on reservations and so forth, people resorted to, the United States resorted to that plan B. So I think this is the same case that what we're seeing here with the jingle dress dance tradition is that, you know, if some of these things get out of hand, we may need to take more coercive measures. Now, I'm not sure how this was received everywhere in Indian country, but it probably was not received all that well. And Ojibwe women ignored it, right? because they created this new tradition here in Minnesota, up into Canada, in Ontario. It was a tradition that began in Ojibwe communities, such as Mille Lacs, but in a short time, it spread to our Dakota neighbors. And historically, you know, there's a great deal of cultural sharing that took place between Ojibwe and Dakota people. I prefer to think about this um, because historians, in Minnesota and in the US have always tried to emphasize intertribal conflict as if that's the only kind of interactions we had with our closest neighbors. But for us, um, you know, we have to think of all the cultural sharing that went on between Ojibwe and Dakota people. They gave rise to things like um, the drum, uh, the big drum ceremonies and others. The jingle dress dance very quickly became and Dakota tradition as well. And I know when I was a kid and going to powwows and dancing at powwows in the 70s, that was like kind of my heyday of the powwow, that we used to have a lot of people who came over from, we used to call it Fort Totten. Here the Dakota people are over here from North Dakota. And those women danced in jingle dresses um, who came to the Red Lake powwow, the Dakota uh, women. And in fact, I have a dress in my closet that is one that has been passed between Ojibwe and Dakota communities for um, a number of years. So Indians were not very receptive to this idea of the suppression of ritualistic dancing. And let me just tell you, it wasn't just the Ojibwe women who were uh, creating and, and passing on to Dakota women this new tradition of healing, and uh, it was expanding into other Ojibwe communities as well, but other Indians in the United States who love their traditional art forms and their dances were commenting back to the Indian office, and, and some of these letters are also in the National Archives. Um, a colleague of mine who teaches, or he teaches, he's a curator at the Smithsonian, he's, he's the curator of American music at the American History Museum. He sent this document to me, which I love. It's from the um, San Ildefonso Pueblo, just north of Santa Fe, and a Tewa community there. And he's, this is what the headmen of the tribe wrote back. And their letter is called In Defense of Indian Dances. And they say, quote, to us, our dances. And if any of you have been to the Pueblos in northern New Mexico, you know, uh, the deer dances and the animal dances and so forth. They're very beautiful, not like powwows 
because there is, you know, the powwows, I always think emphasize individuality, whereas in New Mexico, there's a greater emphasis on, emphasis on the choreography, right? Everybody does the same thing at the same time. And they're very choreographed and really stunningly beautiful. But in defense of Indian dances, the headmen in New Mexico say, quote, to us, and this is the same year as the dance order, our dances are drama, opera, and poetry. So they're trying to put it into terms that maybe somebody in the Indian office would even be able to understand. Our dances are drama, opera, and poetry. They are our heritage from men and women who lived under different conditions than we, but whose stock we are. And I find that so fantastic because the first, one of the first times I saw the animal dances that are performed in January in the San Ildefonso Pueblo uh, years ago, there was a very famous um, Tewa anthropologist, Alfonso Ortiz. And he said to me, I was out in Santa Fe that year on a fellowship when I was younger, and he said, um, Brenda, go to the animal dances. He said, they're really spectacular because what you're seeing are dances that we've been doing from pre-agricultural times in the Southwest. So imagine the Southwest before corn, right? This is how long, he said, they've been doing these dances. So are they gonna give it up because of this little circular from the Indian office in Washington? That was a ridiculous idea. So our drama, our opera, our poetry, our heritage from men and women who lived under different conditions than we, but whose stock we are. As their children, we hold sacred their memories. We believe that the beauties wrought into the rhythmic form of dances by them as expressions of the poetry and valor of their souls are good rather than bad. So, um, I just want to end on that note because I think we need to understand in the history of the Great Lakes, the conditions under which, the harsh conditions under which the jingle dress tradition arose, which was partly this epidemic, but also women had to defy US policy at the time to invent this new healing tradition. So I find that a really inspiring story in a lot of ways, a very hopeful story about the persistence of indigenous culture um, into the 20th century. And the reason why I call the film that you watch Jingle Dress Dancers in the Modern World is, you know, when I was a kid and my grandmother was a jingle dress dancer at Red Lake, I always thought, ah, you know, whatever my grandma's doing, it's old, it's something, you know, from generations ago, it has a long history. And so it was very surprising to me to think about the jingle dress dance being about modernity, about Ojibwe people being part of the making of the modern world, experiencing World War I, this global epidemic of influenza, just as we are now uh, experiencing another global epidemic. So those are my comments. And if Ivy or anybody wants to show me some questions or if anyone wants to ask questions or make comments, um, I'd be happy to hear from you all. Okay, so yeah, so um, let's see if there's questions in the chat. Um, I do have a couple uh, private ones. Um, you don't so, have to tell me your private questions, Ivy. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You can all save those. All right, ones. I'll save those. Um, <laughs> so if people have um, a question, please put it in the chat for Brenda about some of the things that she's she just shared with us um, or comments. Um, if you, if you we have, it looks like we have a healthy group of 61 people. So surely some people have comments or questions. Yeah. So, um, let me look at these private ones real quick. While you're looking for them, I will say, um, I don't know that I mentioned, but 
our, you know, so our exhibit at Blacks opened for that season. It closed down for the pandemic, but it will be reopening with the spring season. And so we are expecting that in um, April, the exhibit will open up again for one more season. So if you haven't seen it, you can go to Mille Lacs and um, see the exhibit. It's kind of a small exhibit, but it's very, I think, very nicely done. And it has dresses from every, I think every Ojibwe reservation in Minnesota. There's a dress from White Earth. There's a dress from, you know, a dress from uh, Red Lake. There are, yeah, some pretty cool historic dresses um, there. And we also try to, we have a Dakota skirt that's really, really old. The historical society would, um, would only let us use the skirt and not the shirt because they're trying very hard to preserve this. And kind of my attitude is always like, just let us put it on display. You know, what good is it to save something forever if no one's ever going to see it again? But, okay. So we have a couple questions there. Um... I oh, good. Wendy Savage. So um, Wendy is saying you're going to be using some of this information because there's going to be a new regalia exhibition at the Tweed. And I wonder, can we um, can we get Wendy in? Can she come on screen and tell us about the exhibit and what they're thinking of doing? It's more broadly about regalia at the yeah. Tweed. Can Let's, we let her in? Can we just wait a little bit for Wendy? We can do that. Um, there is a couple, can we ask a couple questions first? Yeah. Okay, so um, there's one here that says, did Ojibwe people openly share the dance? Yeah. Like you said that they shared it with the Dakota and then it kind of spread, um, but that they, um, did, did they, um, share like the, the the how they did the dance or do the, do the dakota have and other tribes do the dance differently than the ojibwe yeah i think there's a lot of similarities between how the dance was performed um and the dresses themselves you know now we kind of went through a phase of having um and i think we're still in it of having these incredibly elaborate jingle dresses because as the jingle dress became part of powwow culture since uh, the 1980s in a broader way across the United States and Canada, um, there were many more, you know, um, tribal people who brought their own flourishes to it. So I think that the jingle dress is very, um, you know, it's kind of very elaborate now. And I know when I was growing up, m my grandmother, she used to often have kind of a simple black sheet and she would start sewing her dresses with sequins and jingles um, a couple weeks before the powwow. You know, so this is the days before the professional powwow uh, circuit. And it was, things were more informal at that time. So I think her, she always, she strongly identified as a jingle dress dancer. And so she was born, you know, in the first decade of the 20th century. She would have been a teenager at the time the tradition arose. Um, right in the aftermath of the influenza epidemic, but she was a jingle dress dancer and it was part of her, very strong part of her identity. And, you know, she would dance at powwow, she would dance around the house, humming jingle dress songs. And it was something that was very much a part of who she was as an Ojibwe woman. But as far as this borrowing and everything, um, or the or it moving beyond Ojibwe and then Dakota communities. So the tradition seems to have arisen around on Whitefish Bay, Ontario, around Mille Lacs, but it was in all the Ojibwe communities very soon. Some of you may have seen, um, I wrote an essay, a commissioned essay for the Star Tribune Christmas week. They call it the holiday essay. And I talked about the, Bear, um, the Ojibwe people of Bear Island and Leech Lake in the aftermath of the epidemic, because Bear Island out in the middle of Leech Lake uh, was a place where Ojibwe people um, from over there uh, lived for part of the year. And I had 
um, there was a ethnobotanist who came into that community in 1924 and he took a photograph of a woman named Ellen Red Blanket. And she, I kind of call that photograph uh, perhaps the first documented um, photograph of an Ojibwe woman in a jingle dress. That's not to say that there weren't jingle dresses that appeared right after the influenza or during the influenza, I don't really know. But as far as being able to attach a firm date, um, Ellen Red Blanket's very beautiful dress she made herself, uh, which I describe in that piece is perhaps one of the earliest jingle dresses we can document in the Great Lakes. And that was up at Leech Lake, right? Um, so that's, you know, a little distant from the Lax, but it had spread. Um, it was spreading in the early 20th century. Ojibwe women were responsible for its proliferation. And <laughs> some people have kind of suggested in the last year, because I have a colleague uh, I've been working with on this documentary and his really wonderful, likes his Standing Rock photos, are um, are in the documentary. And he is Navajo and his daughters are jingle dress dancers. And some people have kind of suggested, oh, you know, what are those Navajos doing jingle dress dancing? It's like, well, ever since the jingle dress dance tradition began, women spread the tradition, first among Ojibwe communities, other Ojibwe communities, then to Dakota communities, and then later in the 20th century across the United States, it seemed to spread. So it's a wonderful tradition and women appear to have never tried to keep it to themselves, this healing tradition. And so now we see um, many women across the country who practice the jingle dress dance. Okay, so- Okay, there's a question over here about Obazan's mother and- Okay. And there's, there's one from Gina, who's from Red Lake. She 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 talked about um, an old dress that used Copen, Copenhagen jingles and stitched mm -hmm. by, that were stitched by hand. And there was another question earlier that said, "How has it? Um, how has the jingle dress? Um, uh, con like how 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 has it developed into the uh, contemporary sense, into the modern sense now?" Mm -hmm. Well, I think this is the part where the, the kind of pan-Indian thing comes in, that there are lots of different cultural influences on the dress today. Um, and that's the great thing about the exhibit is you can kind of go back and see decade by decade how the dresses looked. Um, the first decade in the 20s, I think jingle dresses looked more like what I described my grandmother's as being a rather simple black shift with a row or two of jingles at the bottom. And we have a dress in the exhibit from Mille Lacs that's black velvet um, sleeveless, and it has just a couple rows of jingles. And even though it's sort of simple, I think it's a very elegant and beautiful dress. We know who made it and who it belonged to, and that's in the exhibit. And then as time goes on, we also have one from the 30s that belonged to Starry Benjamin and it's red polka dot dress and it's very cheerful to kind of look at but the dress is what i was going to say from the 20s they resemble the kind of flapper style of that was in in the 20s and i would argue that jingle dresses um, were influenced by contemporary women's dress styles of the day the dress we have in the exhibit from red lake which i think is beautiful is burgundy and it has uh, an embellished ribbon on the top that came, um, it's almost like bedazzling your outfit, you know, it's embellished with this ribbon design in silver, but it has jingles on the bottom and it's made of almost a, I don't know, it's from the 1930s, but the fabric is not all cotton, it has a kind of give to the fabric and it has a long zinc zipper up the side. And I was talking to the concert, uh, clothing conservationists at the Historical Society, and they were telling me, you know, you can tell this was purchased in a department store because that long zinc zipper up the side was characteristics, uh, characteristic of department store dresses. 
And so maybe that runs counter to our idea of jingle dresses too, that you always make them yourself or someone makes them. Because clearly someone at Red Lake had purchased this dress and turned it into a jingle dress. And the same is true of Obazan's mother's dress that um, he brought in uh, to show us. And it's not kind of behind cases. It was part of the informal part of the exhibit where a lot of women wanted to bring in their dresses or people wanted to bring in these wonderful family heirlooms like Obazan did. And that dress, Obazan's mother's dress, the one embellished with the baking soda cans uh, jingles is also purchased in a department store. Okay, yeah, so that is a beautiful, that was a beautiful dress, all those dresses. Yeah, and they, you know, they change, and I, yeah. I think the fun thing about looking at them over time is they kind of run counter to our ideas sometimes. There's a beautiful dress in the exhibit that has a collar mm -hmm. that's beaded, and if you look underneath it, the conservators were telling me that that had a certain kind of calico in the, underneath the collar that was from the 1890s showing how people, you know, you didn't just go to Joanne fabric like you might today to make a jingle dress and people held on to materials and fabric and they reused them. And in fact, the clothing conservators told me that this Dakota skirt in the exhibit, which is kind of yellowed, it's yellow, kind of mustard yellow, it used to be green and you can kind of see the green dye in it. And they said it was probably at one time drapery fabric. Okay, I love- so People were very resourceful. Yes, I love that. Um, so there's a couple questions and one of the questions in the private chat had uh, to do with like, do you have to have a dream to, ha to make a, a, a jingle dress? Is it, can it be handed down? Um, a lot of people are saying that they they heard that it ha you have to dream of your dress. Mm -hmm. So that's what I've heard as well. Yeah. Um, so do you, can I, you, you know, I don't know that I'm an expert on that, uh, you know, and I, I don't know that I would try to be an expert on that. I hear um, stories about the jingle dress and that's one of the things you see and hear. We also sometimes hear there needs to be a certain number of jingles on your dress. And those, um, you know, I don't want to um, dismiss any of those ideas at all. But Steve was, my husband, who's from Malax, uh, was telling me that he was kind of laughing about the idea of there being, having to be 365 jingles. And he said, wow, you'd be dead by the time you put your 365 jingles on your dress. And he was kind of joking about that. But there are stories like that associated with the jingle dress. And yeah, that's, there are many stories associated with it, which suggests how important it is culturally to people. Yeah. So, okay. So we're, we're like at 18, we have 18 minutes. So I have an idea. Um, we can, um, so Travis Zimmerman, the Muse Mille Lacs Museum director put the dates in for the next show. Um, Becky did put a link to that as well. Um, and we can have uh, Wendy talk about the, the show, but I, I, I was thinking maybe we could op like unmute people and then like, uh, if you if you're a jingle dress dancer um, and you want to to share anything you know yeah. about your experience or uh, your love for the tradition or um, it, or if you want to ask uh, Brenda a question we can do that so how do you what do you think about that Brenda okay so um, I did have one question though that I wanted to ask you before we op we go to Wendy. Um, and so that, that, that order came out from the Department of Interior. And um, I know that uh, things went underground too, like traditions and ceremonies and things like that, because it was against the law to, for American Indians to practice their, tr their religion and spirituality. And so I'm wondering if like in your, in your search in the archives and things like that, um, after this order went out, did, um, were there, did you find reports of the punitive side of things? Like 
were people jailed? Were people killed for doing this? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Um, I don't think so. I don't think people were arrested for it. Um, you know, it's like uh, when we talk about native culture during the assimilation era, being suppressed is the use I most often use is suppression, um, surveillance, uh, those sorts of things were part of Native people's lives at the time. But I don't think it was the case of an actual arrest. But there were things, aspects of Native culture at the time that were regarded as more illegal uh, than others. One was the Sundance, uh, which is mentioned in the, um, in the document. Up in Canada, it's the potlatch ceremony that was outlawed, right? And so there are aspects that are regarded as more detrimental and more emphasis on suppression of religious traditions at the time. And I don't think it was the case that people were being um, arrested so much. And I'm trying to think of how I might describe this, but say there's a powwow at Red Lake, people are out with the flags and we're going to have a powwow and so forth. Um, people just had to be very creative or sometimes they went, as you say, underground with ceremonies um, in order to, you know, people talk about the midday. And I know when we first started going to the midday lodge, how Ob Obazan said to us, we weren't supposed to have any of this, right? That people persisted. They did it I don't know if secrecy is the word, but you did it in private. You didn't go out and, and do things in a very public way because you know they'd be frowned upon. But I'll tell you, you know, how surveillance worked on reservations. And I like to give my grandparents as an example. So when I was working on my book called My Grandfather's Knocking Sticks, my grandfather was from Mille Lacs and my grandmother was from Red Lake. And he went up there after he lost, after they were pushed out of Mille Lacs and he had an allotment of white earth, but he chose to marry my grandmother and move to Red Lake. And at that time, um, they, my grandparents were being watched very closely by the Indian agent on the reservation. And one of the questions was, my grandmother was pregnant and the Indian agent wanted to know had some questions about whether my grandfather was the father of the child and he you know what business was that of his but he insisted on seeing a copy of their marriage license so my grandpa went up to the agency at red lake he spoke ojibwe he showed the agent his marriage license and the agent said because i saw it in in the records well you know that's good and fine but i'm going to talk to the Episcopal minister in Red Bee, our hometown, to see if you really were married. So my grandfather, as a grown man in, you know, 40 years old, had to produce his marriage license, but it wasn't even considered valid by the Indian agent because he wasn't a reliable person as an Ojibwe speaker um, and so forth. So time went on and he, they did figure out that my grandparents had been married in a Christian ceremony by uh, the local minister. And then they became eligible for a housing loan. And their, um, and their, you know, they, they were able, they had more access to things on the reservation. So that's kind of how the reservation system worked. It wasn't so much that people were being arrested per se, but they were um, denied you know, denied the housing loan, right? Mm -hmm. So that was the way things worked. And so that was, I think, how we have to think of it more than, you know, line up, you're being arrested. It was who, you know, who goes to boarding school, who speaks English, who does these things in the reservation system. Um, and that's, and there's someone who decides at the Indian agent who gets the resources and who doesn't. Okay. Does that make sense? It does. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So I, I, I'm looking through the questions again, and I'm just going to ask this one last one, and then we'll turn it over to Wendy. Um, and so uh, do you know, uh, she wants to know more about the 
the healing aspect of the dance? Do you know if the women set out with the intention of it being a healing practice or has that purpose evolved over yeah. time? Yeah, is that's there, a good question. Yeah. So, the, and this is, you know, I've been talking about this a little bit in the public and I had that felt so happy to have that piece in the New York Times, an op-ed this spring called When Art is Medicine. And the way I kind of like to explain the jingle dress dance to, um, to people, especially people who don't know powwows or native culture and cultural traditions or ceremonial life, is that I, the way I look at the jingle dress dance tradition is that it's very much about psychological healing, right? And this is something we're all gonna be going through. Right now, we're in the middle of a pandemic. Some of us have lost people we love. And we know that once you, you know, lose someone close to you and so forth, you don't just say, wow, that was a tough week, you know, let's move on. There's a psychological healing, even if you have been sick, or even if you had been sick with COVID, right? You know, there's a, there's kind of a, you know, it's not just your, bo your bodily sickness can recede, but you still have to think, man, I had this terrible virus and I have to, you know, that was really something to go through. And there's a psychological dimension to healing. And that's what I think Ojibwe people are experts at. They know that it's not just the body, that there's a psychological dimension. And I really look at the jingle dress dances coming along in the aftermath of the influenza, not so much to um, just help us deal with bodily sickness, though that could be part of it, but it's the trauma associated with disease and the understanding that song, dance, composing songs, dancing for someone, dancing in a community, that all of these things are how we get better, how we deal with difficulties. And so that's what I think the real genius of Ojibwe um, kind of intellectual traditions and spiritual traditions is that it's about this psychological um, aspect of healing. That's what I think women were trying to do in the aftermath. And we're all going to be, you know, I've had my vaccine. I hope some of you have had your vaccine and we get to get back to some sense of normalcy. But just because we're going out into the world again or starting to, hopefully, it doesn't mean that we're going to be over the pandemic, right? And I think about those folks down in the Mississippi band of Choctaw, you know, where I was reading a story about young, one young man who lost, he graduated from high school this spring and he lost his mother and his father to COVID-19. So that's a trauma that is, is going to be facing that young person for you know, months and years to come. And I think that's where the psychology of healing is where the jingle dress dance comes in. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, so we have about six minutes left. Um, and so I, uh, Wendy, if you want to unmute yourself and just share a little bit about just briefly about the exhibition at the Tweed Museum. I also see that, um, uh, uh, oh, someone from the Tweed is on here as well. Carissa. Oh, good. Carissa, yes. So, so Wendy, go ahead. Uh, we're, we're just, can you hear me? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Am I coming through? Okay. This, you know, I don't do real well at Zoom. I, I live out in the boondocks all by myself. But Tweed is having an exhibition, a very small exhibition, uh, taking out of their Richard and Dorothy Nelson collection. And then I have some uh, of my personal work in there, a small jingle dress kind of based on like a jumper one, because I fell in love with the, the 20s and I make hats and I do clochures, clochures and that. But what I'm doing with Dr. Allison Owney is writing curriculum that we're going to be passing out to uh, the community for teachers to use. And 
the jingle dress, I, you know, I've made a couple of them and, and I've heard a couple of different things about, about it too. And, and it's become this huge, huge healing ceremony for everybody. You know, at one time I heard, oh, you, you know, you're supposed to be told to make the dress. There's certain specific ceremonial things you have to go through to be a jingle dress dancer. Well, culture changes, tradition changes, and now it's going all across the nation. And isn't that magnificent that this one ceremony is going to heal the entire nation just by doing it? And then the missing and murdered Indigenous women are now making red jingle dresses. Mm -hmm. And that's the next thing I'd like to do when I'm not writing or doing everything else at home is I'd love to make a red jingle dress. Mm -hmm. So I just, you know, I find some of the information really exciting, but we should let uh, Carissa talk a little bit more about Tweed than me and I'll be getting a hold of Brenda and kind of getting back to her about, I don't want, what lesson plan could I make for the jingle dress? And I think I've got more of a specific focus of the young children today need to know that they're living through history. They're making history today. Wow. Okay, Carissa is not, no longer on the, on the Zoom. Do you know when that exhibit is? Starts. Okay. I'm on. I'm on Zoom. Yeah. Oh, you are. Oh, good. Yeah. Chill, thank chill you. Good. Yeah. No. I. I just want to say thank you so much, Wendy, for you know helping us with the, the display, and um, I. I just love your jingle dress that you. You. Uh, <laughs> my little jumper. Us. Yeah. I, I my love little it. jumper. <laughs> yeah. So. So I'm glad to have it in in the display, and then we also have another, jingle dress by Orvilla Long Fox, who recently passed on, I believe, last summer. Um, so it's good that we have um, that particular jingle dress, mm -hmm. although it's not made with with the jing the traditional jingles, you know, the tins, it's it's made with deer hooves. Oh so, yes. Yes. So we so we have that on display too. Um, and yeah, so so we're we're finishing up this exhibition. Um, we're hoping to open soon. So we, we want people, especially to the public, we were only open to the campus community last fall. Um, and, you know, we have all these, these great exhibits up and, you know, we want everyone to come and see them. So, but, but yeah, you know, it's, it's good to see you, Brenda. I mean, we haven't seen each other in a long time and I really, you know, appreciate this presentation and and your um, YouTube video and everything that that you've said um, as usual. So Brenda was my uh, graduate school advisor. So and as always, my friend. So mm -hmm. it's great. I, I appreciate this. So um, you know, we'll have more information on our temporary website about when we're opening. Hopefully, it'll be soon. Okay. Thank you so much, Carissa. Miigwech. Thanks, Carissa. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. Can we just hear quickly from Travis about the, the jingle dress exhibit at the coming back to the museum? So Travis, can you share real quick? Yeah, so um, uh, Brenda had just said that we'll be opening in April. That was our hours a couple years ago when the exhibit first opened. But uh, this year we're not opening until June 2nd. So we'll be opening June 2nd and it'll run until October 31st. And we'll be open Wednesday through Saturdays, um, 10 and 10 a.m. till 5 p.m. Okay. Is there a fee? Uh, yes, uh, there is a fee to get in the museum. It's free for Mille Lacs Band members and for Minnesota Historical Society members. And then we do have a fee for the um, exhibit, which also includes a tour of the Four Seasons room. Okay. Thank you so much. So um, it is four o'clock and Brenda has another webinar that she has to get on. So um, we, um, maybe we can bring you back again and, and just have discussion because it seems like there's still a lot of questions and a lot of excitement over this. And there's some private messages I haven't even seen come through. So, um, but we'll try to do this again. Okay, you're, you're up for that? Yes, and thanks for inviting me. Yeah, and thank for you. organizing all this, Ivy. It was uh, nice to be with everybody. Yes, thank you so much. And thank you all for joining us. I will send out an email with the link to the recording and also to the link to the survey. So please fill that out. Um, 
and uh, we will be in touch. Follow ACO's Facebook page for upcoming sessions, culture and healing sessions. So um, yeah, thank you so much, Miigwech Brenda. And give our best to Steve, your husband Steve, and your family, and everybody be well. Goodbye.